tell you, the Father of heaven, the Father of lights, is in our midst. He wants to do a work in our lives. And resistance is going on, no doubt. I've been sensing it. Resistance. But God is out to conquer. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Jesus said this, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Powerful portion of Scripture. Jesus giving a warning to the disciples and to all those who would listen, and even down through the ages, and even to our present day, the days of Noah being compared to the Son of Man's days, the days of the Son of Man or the Son of Man's days being compared to the days of Noah. The days of Noah was a day of age past. He bridged the yester world and the world we find ourselves in today. Noah was that bridge from what is called today as the primeval age, the age before the flood, the age that we don't have all kinds of records and there's not all kinds of printed material, there's not a library and all that took place basically. But the remnants of the flood have carved its way into all of the earth. A total devastating flood took place and destroyed everything. Though many today would deny it, some would despise it, the evidence is unmistakable. Many people looking out through the world recognize that something catastrophic once took place. They just don't want to call it the flood. It's called everything, and they know that it took place, and they know something happened. Watching a show not too long ago said, oh, about 10,000, 8,000 years ago, something happened and, and pretty much destroyed the world as they knew it. We don't know exactly what it was, but... Well, let me check. And, the, and it's everywhere. The evidence is everywhere. But it's denied. This age was an age like yours and mine in the sense that people ate, drank, and married, and were given in marriage, meaning that there were places to eat and things to eat, this was an age where there were no storms and no rain. It was a different world than we know today. People lived up until the 900 years old. When someone said, you know, go see the old man, they meant it. There was an age where there weren't hurricanes or tornadoes sweeping through. It was an age of, of, uh, of cities Culture, advancement, I know that science likes to portray that we evolved from the ape and the chimp and the monk and everything else that's around there and eventually stood up straight and we were using sticks as clubs, and, but that's not so. There were advanced cultures. Cain himself went and built cities. There were art and tools being made. There were families and there were customs and there were traditions. Just as there are today, there's traditions and there's families and there's marriages taking place and people go out to eat and want to have family dinners together and family's family and life is life and people were moving about and, and the Sethites, the children of Seth, called upon the Lord. But even they started falling away from the things of God until finally there's just Noah who was found blameless. And the Lord saw, had grace upon him and told him to build an ark. An ark of safety because total destruction was coming on everything else that wasn't of faith. Hear me now. Total destruction was coming upon everything that wasn't of faith. And only Noah and his family were found to be in the faith. 
The Bible says that they were filled with violence. The entire earth was filled with violence. Cain built cities. Jesus says that they ate, they drank, they married. And if they were given in marriage, it means there were family contracts involved and they were given in marriage. Somebody came and asked for and, and their and the wife was given and there were dowries and there was, there was life going on. And there's a very noble, honorable aspect of family honor and, and enjoying one another's company. And, but that doesn't necessarily make it godly. I've seen many people pride themselves on family tightness and not live a godly life. Family tradition rules. Family customs rule. I've seen people give their whole lives to just being connoisseurs of restaurants. But that doesn't make them good people just because they know good food. People can have all kinds of ways that they expend their life and enjoy one another's company and go to art shows and call themselves cultured and sophisticated. Go to music shows, play instruments, hard worker and pride yourself on being a hard worker and maybe very artistic and very able. Working with metal, working with stone, working with wood, working with jewelry and all kinds of things. Working with dresses and, and attire and all kinds and cutting hair and cutting nails and all the things that people do. All kinds of games that we can play today. All kinds of board games, all kinds of golf games, all kinds of sports games, all kinds of amusement, all kinds of entertainment. But none of those things make us people of faith. We can pat ourselves on the back and we can do all kinds of things to say that's a wonderful person, that's a nice person, you're a good guy, she's a good girl, what a great family, what hard workers. Boy, they got a lot of money. Wish I had their money. They got a little money. Don't want that. Wish they had this. People were sick. People were healthy. People live long. People live short. Same thing. Same thing that's went on then is going on today. Same thing. And Jesus is saying that the whole earth is so filled with violence at that time that Jesus is saying that the days of the Son of Man will be the same way as the days of Noah. Meaning that when the ark was being built, God tells Noah to build an ark. And this ark was 450 feet long. 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. How would you like to receive that command from the Lord? That's a building project. And he's given this building project to build this huge box of refuge, this huge box of safety. Destruction is coming, he said. I'm declaring it by the word of the Lord. Destruction is coming. And there's only one way out, the ark of safety. Build it. Hey, uh, you're God, why don't you build it? Build it. Noah believed God, applied himself to the task, saying, you mean entire destruction is coming? I can't fathom that, I can't see that. Doesn't that seem like a bit harsh? Doesn't it seem like a bit extreme? Noah believed God. And started building this project. And in the meantime, many just quite frankly didn't believe and did not pay attention to it. Noah was the fool of the age. The preacher of righteousness, the Bible says. A man who stood for righteousness and preached godliness. And no one followed after Noah. No one cared for. Was watching out for. Can you imagine Noah saying, what are you building? Destruction is coming. A flood is coming. The entire world as you know it is not going to be the same way. What do you mean rain? See, the Bible says that it never rained back then. The whole earth was, was instead in a state of a mist with kind of like a water ice chasm above us and below us. And in all things, a destruction is coming that you can't fathom and see, but you've got to know and that there's only one way out, the ark of safety. But no one was watching. No one was given care for. No one was concerned about. No one gave it consideration. No one put value on the Word of God. The Word of God promised destruction. And no one was giving it weight. No one was giving it value. No one was giving it the worth that it deserved except Noah. How do we know that he gave it weight? How do we know that he gave it value? Because he applied himself to the task. That's how we know. He applied himself to the task. 
And so we can see it as he's building this ark. And all of a sudden, one day, that ark has finally got the last peg in it. The last bit of pitch is put in and it's, it's ready. Now what? Get in. Get in the ark. Bring the animals. They're going to come in. And the Bible says that the Lord put it in and called them forth. And the Lord is the one who shut the door. Shut. And what the Lord shuts is shut. And Jesus is saying that the days of the Son of Man are going to be the same way, meaning no one's giving consideration about putting weight on it. But those people of faith are putting weight on it, value, recognizing the truthfulness of it and are watchful of it. Here they ate, they drank, they had good times, they had bad times, they had violent times, they had ungodly times. Are we not seeing even what's going on today? Violence on the rise, ungodliness, all kinds of things that people can do throughout all the earth. But how many are really paying attention to the destruction that is looming just over the horizon? And living their life in light of recognizing it's time for me to enter the ark of safety called Christ Jesus. Enter into the ark of safety, the ark of refuge. All of humanity's refuge is Christ Jesus. Without Christ, no refuge, no salvation, no rescue. There's no other way. What does the Bible say? In verse 27, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. The flood came just as he promised. And what happened to everybody? I mean, think about the words that he uses. Destroyed them all. Everything. People could look at me today and say, well, that's just doom saying. Just call it what you want, but it's the truth. He's the one who says destroyed them all. Sounds like doom to me. Sounds like you finally called it right. Sounds like doomsday. Yeah, that's right. Except for those who are in the ark of safety. How do I get in? Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone who enters into the life of Christ, those who are born again by the Spirit of God, recognize that they're in the ark of safety and live and apply their life accordingly. I saw a Gallup poll this morning. I don't know if you saw it on the news. The Gallup poll says that three out of ten people in America take the Bible literally. Take the Bible literally, that what it said is what it means. Three out of ten, 30%. So if we had 30% of the populace in America truly believe that the Bible is the word of God taken to be taken literally, if we've got 200 million, 300 million, that should be a lot of people believing God right now. Living for God with all holiness, with all love, with all joy. What is that, 60, 70 million, 80 million, 90 million, depending on how many are in America? This should be right now living for God. Or we got a whole lot of people that are going to find themselves in the wrong category. Because they believe that the Bible is to be taken literally, but don't. God is calling for people back to a state of holiness and consecrated life. People are resisting, struggling. I want it my way. I want to be reputed. I want to be recognized. I want to be rewarded. I want to be credited. I don't need that foolishness. I've got better things to do with my Sunday. Don't you know the restaurant just came out with a new breakfast sandwich? Got to try it. We've given ourselves over to such foolishness and such stoop superstition and such superficiality that we're missing out on the supercenter of Christ Jesus coming. Does this mean that we're to stay home all day long and, and to just stay in a black robe and the blind shut with our Bibles open going on? Does this mean that we don't do anything, we don't say anything, we're hiding all the time and we pray on our knees all day long and we just read the Bible. We don't talk to anybody. We eat meager little saltines and crackers and just a little bit of soup and a little bit of water and don't pay attention to anything. It's meaning engage life and let life engage you that in all things you're conscious of the coming of Christ. 
And everything that you do, all the work that you do, all the play that you do, all the conversations that you have, all that you watch, all that you see, all that you do, the music you listen to, the fun that you give yourself to, you're always conscious of knowing that you belong to Christ Jesus. That there is no other way than Christ in your life. And you and I live our lives according to Christ, knowing that the power of his everlasting life is seething into your soul and is, is flowing in your veins and your spirit, man, is being enlivened by his very presence. So that you stay away from the coarse, the crude, and the carousing. You stay away from all the things that are ungodly and all the things that don't profit. And instead you recognize that Christ is in your life. Just the other day... My family and I went and enjoyed a, a time of water skiing on the, on the lake. Oh, no, I, I can't do that. Uh, Christ is coming. I, I can't be water skiing. I, I can't be swimming with the kids. Uh, no, no, we're going to have a barbecue. Oh, no, I can't do that. Uh, I've got to read my Bible all day long. Don't you know that? And we like some people like to paint it sometimes as though life stops completely and that you're to bury your head in the carpet and spend the rest of your life there when Christ is calling you to stand up and walk like a man and stand mature before him. And everything that you do, let it be known that you belong to him. And let the happiness of his presence come into your life. And let the joy of the Lord come into your feet. And also let the strength come into your legs and into your arms. And let your eyes be fixed on the coming of the Lord. And that at any moment you recognize that whether you're in a boat, a car, whatever you're doing, walking along with a friend, you've got Jesus in your heart, Christ on your mind, the kingdom before you, the joy of the Lord, your strength. And all that you say and do, recognize that God is in you, going through every fiber of your being. And you recognize saying, I'm a new creation in Christ. And you're willing to speak. Speak to the stranger about the things of Christ. For your family members about the things of Christ. You stand for truth. You let faith be stirred and you recognize that God is doing a work in your life. You live your entire life for the things of God. And all that you find yourself to do and anything that's not of him, you do not pay attention to it. The coarse, the crude, the carousing, you want no part of it. The superficiality, the, 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 the superficial, the foolishness and the superstitions, you stay away from it. I don't want nothing to do with it but you recognize that Christ is in your life. You're careful what you laugh at and what you say, and you're always looking to advance the kingdom in your life and in everyone else around you. You live a holy life, a life unto Christ Jesus. We went to the baseball game Thursday night. And Thursday night, we were at a baseball game. Yep, God, godly men and people came together and went to a baseball game. And everything that was said and everything that was done was done in a way with the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, enjoyed the ball game, but more enjoyed one another's company. Daniel had his youngest son there, little Daniel. Right there, little Daniel. was right there on a Thursday night. He could care less what I'm saying right now. Care less. He's, see, he's, but you know, it's allowed for him. He's just a young stir. He's, what, two years old. But when you're 20 and still doing the same thing, you got issues. Little Daniel was at the baseball game, sitting on his father's lap, then on Adams, then on Stevens, then on Mike's, down the aisle, up the aisle, having a snack, enjoyed a great time, L loved the men, the ball game, this, that, and just enjoyed everyone's fellowship. Now, not so, Daniel. Enjoyed it. And we enjoyed watching him. He was better than the ball game. So why am I bringing this up in the midst of a Noah sermon with destruction coming? How, all right, going to make a link here? Sure am. Because see, earlier that day, he was given a command. Earlier that day, he wanted to do his own deal. He had plans, two-year-old plans. Don't you know that there was mud pies to be made? Does anybody have any idea? That there were trucks to be moved, wagons to be rolled, bugs to be slapped, berries to be picked, skitters to run from. That he had plans. And how is this day going to unfold if somebody comes and steals all his fun? But mama had a rule. Mama had a command. Mama had something for him. He wants to do this and go to the ball game. 
And he's going to do what he wants until the time of the ball game. But see, Mama interceded with a command. And Mama came in and said that if you want to go to the ball game tonight, you need to take a nap now. Simple command. And Daniel just turned around and went, oh, understanding. Oh, okay. And went upstairs and took a nap. <laughs> Easy obedience. Just like that. Oh, okay. And went and did what he was supposed to do. Went upstairs, put himself to bed, took his nap, and had a great night. But he would have ruined his day had he chosen his own way. What a great statement. He would have ruined his day had he chosen his own way. Instead, he obeyed and got his way. He ended up having a great night, was up later than a two-year-old should be, because he paid the price when he didn't want to, and gave up the beggarly and the foolish and the childish things, and enjoyed fellowship with the men. And isn't Christ doing the same thing to us today? Wake up. Walk this way. Give up the foolish and the childish things now and recognize that God has something greater for you. It's the same thing. God has a plan for us today. That life in Christ is not about all day long drudgery. I don't go through all day long drudgery. I go through all day long expectation. All day long anticipation. The irritations come. The frustrations come. But the anticipation and expectation override all those things. I'm always expecting of what God's going to do in someone's life. Hoping with anticipation what God is going to do here on Sunday morning with someone's life. Almost every Sunday morning, I leave this place blessed with seeing something happen in someone's life. Burdened seeing somebody that's still under the weight of it. And sometimes just broken by it. And sometimes, just quite like, frankly, bothered because you see the arrogance in someone's life saying, I have not gone that way, and it bothers you. Almost every Sunday, leaving, blessed, bothered, and burdened. But the blessing is worth it. Faith sees what a person can be when Christ enters the picture. When Christ comes alive in, alive in someone's life, when their eyelids open, when their mind comes alive, when they get past the foolish and childish ways, when they stop giving me the look like they don't care, when they sit there in that defiant way and they finally recognize, saying, you know what, I've decided, I want Christ, and start putting feet to it. What excitement happens. Something happens, and all of a sudden you recognize that God is in our midst and moving. It's a wonder to see. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. As we bring this to a close, let's look at Proverbs chapter 23, 17. 17 and 18. Proverbs 23, 17 and 18. Let me read it for you. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Surely there is a hereafter. Your hope will not be cut off. There is a hereafter. There is an afterlife, as the Egyptians would call it. There is a place that is found, and there's a place of blessing called heaven, one with Christ. And there is a hell. There is a lake of fire. There is a cut off from the Lord. And it says that do not let your heart envy sinners. All the things that they're doing, getting, gaining, going, enjoying, and doing all their mud pie stuff. That's right. No matter how wealthy, no matter what position, no matter how much fame, no matter what the clothes, the jewelry, the talk, the People magazine, the Us magazine, the Star magazine, all the entertainment shows, the this and the that, the positions, the political power, the say, I don't care where a lick of them. It's all mud pie business. Every stitch of it. Mud pie business meaning relating it to our story on Daniel. When God has something greater for us, all we have to do is just simply, I understand, and do it. Putting your life to it. It says that don't let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord. How often? All the day. All the day. Which is what I said earlier. 
the fear of the Lord, all the day recognizing, all the day, all the time, recognizing the fear of the Lord. It overrides you. It, you recognize that that fear is a love for. You recognize that that fear of the Lord delivers you of all your other fears. You recognize that the fear of the Lord keeps you with the understanding that the Lord comes and is coming. And the evidence is in your heart right now. And it, then it gives this assurance, for surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Here I put it forth to you this way. There are two philosophies that you can enjoy, that you can give yourself to. There's the here and now, and there's the hereafter. Choose this day. Here and now. It says, I'm going to take mine here and now. And then there's the hereafter. I know there's something waiting for me. Little Daniel, here and now, mud pie business, trucks to be moved, wagons to be rolled, flies to be swatted, laughter to be done, here and now or hereafter? Here and now, all the things you want, go get the toys, go do this, go do that. Don't think we're just showing up in church paying our dues. Church is something you live for and live in. You live, move, and have your being in the Holy Spirit is what the Bible says. We live, move, and have our being in the Holy Ghost. The church is in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is in us, the Holy Spirit. The church, serious business. Eternities are decided, even here and now. It's saying, here and now, I'm going to live my life and get mine. Whenever I take my last breath, it's when I take my last breath. Or I'm going to live for the hereafter, which says that every breath that I have between now and my last day belongs to the Lord. Every breath is mine. I'm going to enjoy it. Every breath is his, and I'm going to give it. Here and now, hereafter. Here and now, hereafter. Here and now, hereafter. Right here, right now. Want what I want? Don't care who cares. I'm going to get mine, do what I want. No one's going to tell me what to do. Hereafter, I belong to you, Lord. All that I am, all that I'm not, my brokenness, my failures, my fears, my frets, I'm yours. I'm a basket case. Would you make me new? He starts working in our midst, fashioning and forming us, making you stand in the confidence and the truthfulness of Christ. Whether we're young and old alike, every parent in this room, you're given the charge to raise that child up in the things of God. Every charge and every person in this room, you're given charge to be a witness unto Christ Jesus. Everybody in this room is given charge to dedicate the glory of the Lord, to dedicate all that you are to the glory of the Lord. Every one of us in this room is to be a witness unto Christ Jesus. Every one of us, young or old alike, is to live a life that is, that is pleasing to Him. Because if we're not pleasing Him, we're pleasing something that's not Him. And to please something not Him is to get that same lot. This is not a time to just sit back and say, oh, well, let me ponder on this. It's a time for action. We're coming to the end of all days. And Jesus himself said 2,000 years ago that the days of the Son of Man are surely coming. The days of the Son of Man are surely coming. It's not a time for pride. It's not a time for the pompous. It's not a time for the prejudice. It's a time for the people of God to come alive in Christ Jesus. It's a time for us to be consecrated unto Christ. It's a time for us to recognize that it's God's way and there is no other way. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the Bible said it leads to death. There's a way that seems right to man, and we give ourselves honor and glory and nobleness for it, but the Lord says He judges the heart. In these things we recognize, Lord, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable to you, O Lord. Let the actions of my hands be set to the plow called Christ. And let me plow for the gospel of Jesus Christ into people's lives. And you'll notice that that's what we're doing even in this church. We're plowing through the hearts of people. And we're trying to lay that seed into there and have it come alive. And we are trusting the Lord for him to give increase into people's lives. Even now you're probably sensing this word and this gospel plowing through your life. Even now you're plowing through your heart and you find that furrow called the Christ coming in and he's burrowing into your, into your old heart and he's turning it over and he's turning out those rocks and you find it digging in and he's going to lay the seed in there, the seed called Christ. And all of a sudden you're going to find it start maturing and start blobbing and all of a sudden it pops and all of a sudden you start recognizing it gives forth and it starts coming forth and it burst forth and they start recognizing and somebody starts saying, something's happened to you. You're not the same way. That's right. 
There's a new tree in town. There's a new person coming forth, and it starts growing and maturing and finally brings forth fruit, and Christ commends that and does not condemn that work. But the fruitless fig tree is condemned already. In this, let he who has an ear hear what the word of the Lord is saying, because we truly are coming, if not already, in the days of the sons of man. The Son of Man is truly coming. The Son of Man has already come into many people's hearts and down through the ages. People have called upon the name of the Lord and have found the salvation of God. People have lost children for the sake of Christ. Missionaries have buried their own young in the soil of foreign countries. Missionaries who came here have buried their own young in the soil of America, even New England. When those babies come alive in Christ Jesus and those people right here in New England on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they'll be the very ones holding us to standard. This is not a time for us to sit back and judge and this is not a time for us to sit in nobility. This is not a time for us to be pompous. This is not a time to just, oh, who cares? Let somebody else do it. This is a time to come alive in Christ Jesus. This is a time to take a stand for, for, for the things of God. This is a time to let truth prevail in our lives. This is a time for brokenness to come into our lives and every fiber of our being. This is a time to tell the kids to rise up and serve the Lord. Don't let them be given to bashfulness and timidity and insecurities and inferiorities, but let them come alive in Christ Jesus. Speak forth the truth. Teach them the ways of God, not through harshness, but rather draw them and set the example. Follow me as I follow Christ, son. Follow me as I follow Christ, daughter. Follow me as I follow Christ, mother. Follow me as I follow Christ, father. Follow me as I follow Christ, friend. Come unto Jesus and find the salvation that he has, the strength that he has. Because when those tombstones open that you thought were closed forever, forever, and when the voice of Christ and the trumpet calls and the dirt flies open and that person flops up and comes up and is walking and rising with Christ in the clouds of the air, you're going to recognize that everything that you said that was called harsh, everything that you did that was called foolish. Everything that you did and everything that you said had meaning when it's in Christ Jesus and all of it is made known for what it really is. Rise up with them now. See yourself even now popping out of that grave. Even now sense your spirit changing. See your body coming alive. Sense yourself rising and meeting Christ in the air. See the sea of glory that's about to become. Let faith come alive. See it for what it is and let your faith come alive in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Praise His holy name. See it. See it. See it. It is truly coming. It's here right now. It's in this church. He's in this church. He's in these believers. He's on prayer night. He's on Wednesday night. He's in your home. He's in your heart. He's doing a lot of work in your life. He's doing a work in my life. We're taking steps. Because one day, I want you to picture it, where all of a sudden you can rise, all of a sudden see yourself rising. What if he came right now? What if even this Sunday morning, even now, imagine all of us has changed in the twinkling of an eye. Picture it and start rising together. All those who are in Christ Jesus, imagine us right now rising. And you say, I knew of it. I read it. I understood it. I acknowledged it. I agreed with it. But here it is. And all is left behind. And all of a sudden, your focus is strictly on Jesus. I'm going to meet him in the clouds of the air. And you're rising. All the other believers rising. And you're meeting the Lord now and forevermore where the restrictions of this world and the natural laws no longer, hold, no longer have a hold on you, where gravity no longer has a hold on this body, but your spirit is free from the confines of natural law. And you rise and you meet him in the air. That is something to behold in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let this July move you. Let this year move you. Let Christ move you. Don't give yourself over to all the foolishness in our own ways. Think of little Daniel, mud pies, and, and look at those dirty hands on Facebook filled with mud, and filled with mud, and he's so happy, and he's proud of himself, and all the things he's been doing. But you who know and you who understand, don't live that childishness. Recognize that there's a simple law for us to obey. Obey. 
Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. Just do that. Just go, oh, okay, and do it. And you'll be amazed that all of a sudden you find yourself in the darkest of hour. You'll be all of a sudden with the Lord for now and forevermore because you followed the simple command unto Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a time for each and every person to just make that decision. Decisions time are coming. Decisions times through the course of the week. All through the week, saying yes to the things of God. The children have been wonderful as we preach this word. The Lord's going to be bringing us down the line to an altar call. It's not today. The Lord's going to be moving upon this church and drawing us out of our pride and drawing us out of, out of our affections. But today's not the day. The Lord's going to bring increase and he's looking for a solid core that he can build on. Are you that solid core? Are you sold out for Christ or given over to this and to that? Become that solid core that no matter what takes place, there's nothing for it to collapse on. You stand fast. He's going to do a work. I sense it. Many people sense it. You can feel it. He's here. And it's coming. It surely is coming. We must stay the course. Stay focused on the things of God. Be sold out for Christ. Consecrated lives. He's going to move on children. He's going to move on young and old alike. He's going to touch lives. Those who don't want it will sit there in their pride and say, what's going on? Or, oh, here's another service. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. Don't miss it. I beg of you, don't miss it. Catch what God has for you. Catch what God has for you and your family. Give yourself fully to it. Speak of his name. If you've recently given your life to the Lord and you haven't told anybody yet, then go and tell some people today. This through the course of the week, let it be known, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Christ. All the things that I thought were foolish is now in me. I'm him. I'm it. I'm foolish. Let the foolishness of Christ speak forth. It's the wisdom of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Is there anybody in this room other than myself who can sense that the Lord is doing a work? Would you raise? Just let them know. You can sense it. Amen? Amen. Through the course of this week, through the course of this week, why don't you do some reading in regards to the coming of the Lord? Do some reading in regards to Proverbs that we just read, chapter 23. Look through some of them. Let the Lord stir. If you're busy, you're getting up early and you're doing things, I tell you, just sit back. Take that 15 minutes. Take that half hour. Read your Bible. Dwell on the things of God. And just recognize the coming of the Lord. Let thankfulness, think of the things you're thankful for. Let, don't let any offense burrow in. Don't let anything trouble you in such a way that disturbs your peace, but instead recognize and be thankful for what God is doing. He is coming back. The hereafter is almost here. In this, Lord, make me a hereafter person in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Would you stand before the king? So cute. So, thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven, we commit this work and these souls unto thee, the Father of lights. Let no person leave this room without a decision that I want more of you in my life. I will seek you and I will find you when I search for you with all my heart. That's what your word says. As we sang and as we declared and as we praised your holy name, Lord, we want the love of God in our lives, the love that sets us free from our fears, the love that sets us free from this world, the love that, desire, that puts it in us to, to want the kingdom of God alive in our hearts. Move upon us, Lord, in Jesus' name. I look forward with anticipation and with expectation of what you're going to do over the course of this next month over the course of this next year, what will we look like by the end of the year? Lord, I look forward to seeing what you're going to do. It's in your name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Enjoy one another's company. Enjoy the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen.